And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce your first speaker today, uh, Kathy Perkins. Kathy, the floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. It's really nice to have all of you here today. Uh, this program, <coughs> excuse me, this program is the first in a series, as most of you know. With today, we have Hans Wagner, the Chief Sustainability Officer of National Geographic. Uh, and you probably know this, most of you probably know this, but the way this got started was through some research that George Seraphim and I conducted. Uh, with Chief Sustainability Officers. First, what we did is conducted a survey, and then we followed up with a series of interviews of people that we found to be particularly interesting. Uh, and I'll show you the list of folks that participated in the interviews. Hans Wagner was the first person that we interviewed by phone, and he is the first person to join us for the webinars today. You can see the rest of the list, and we'll have many of these people throughout the next few months on webinars. So we hope that you'll continue to be interested and join us for the additional webinars as well. Now, just to get us started, I know we have people that are scattered across the, the globe, actually, uh, and we'd like to know where you're located today. So what we'd like for you to do is either you can raise your hand and we'll have you speak and tell us where, you, where you're located today, or if you prefer, you can type in in the chat uh, box down at the lower right-hand corner if you'd rather do that. So let's get started. Who would like to start in telling us uh, where you're located today? Hey, Kathy, I'll start. This is Karen, and I'm in North okay. Carolina. Okay, thank you, Karen. Very good. Well, this is Bruce Bramer. I'm in northern Kentucky, not very far away. <laughs> okay. Hi, Bruce. Bruce and I know each other. <laughs> okay. Next. Okay, Preston Miles is in Danville, Kentucky. All right, welcome, this is, Preston. This is Ed here. I'm in Farmington, Connecticut. You're in Connecticut. Okay, yep. East Coast. All right. Who else do we have? Gulen, why don't you tell us where you're located today? Uh-oh, the phone's not working. Uh, uh, I, I'm no. uh, in Turkey. I'm located in Turkey at the moment. So she probably wins the prize for being the farthest away, I would say. Who else? Yeah. Paul Brooks here from Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Very good, Paul. Dan? Oh, she already typed it in. Bonita Springs, Florida. And I have two people sitting in my office today that I'll introduce because they may be asking questions. Uh, Steve Perkins, do you want to say where you're from? Or uh, Louisville, Kentucky? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> and Phil <Seal> Stevens. <laughs> so, so they may jump in and ask questions as we go today. All right. What I would like to do very quickly this morning is I want to get a feel for how much you know about National Geographic before we turn this over to Hans. Um, if you would, would you please indicate, look at the first poll on the top, which of the following statements are not true about National Geographic? If you put a little tick mark in the boxes that you think are not true, uh, that will be interesting to see how, what you think of National Geographic or what you know. And then at the bottom, what you can do is you can hit the pencil icon at the top of the poll and put a tick mark on the continuum in terms of how familiar you are or unfamiliar, for that matter, with National Geographic. So if you would just take a second to do that, that will give us a feel for your familiarity with the organization. Okay, so what I'm seeing is that most of the audience is somewhat familiar with the organization, but not very familiar with the organization. And if you look at the poll um, on the top, what we have is, uh, let's see, three of you said Alexander Graham Bell was, uh, was not a past president, and in fact, he was a past president. So that, that's actually true. Mm. <laughs> the, society, the society was formed by a group of scientists. That's true. Everybody knows that. 
Uh, the first National Geographic magazine was published several years after the Society was established. That is correct. That is not true. The magazine was published the, the very same year that the Society was uh, put into place. The magazine has not been known for its articles on climate change and endangered species. In fact, the magazine is known for those sorts of articles. So that gives us an idea of what your familiarity is and some little known facts about National Geographic. And in introducing Hans, I wanted to carry on with a the theme a little bit in how much do you know about National Geographic. I'll have to say I've talked to Hans over the last few months and I have learned a great deal about National Geographic. And I wanted to just present very quickly some, some facts about it. It's an organization that's 125 years old, actually I think it's 126 years old at this point. Um, it's a private, not-for-profit organization. Uh, you may or may not have known that. It's a nonprofit scientific and educational organization, one of the largest in the world. It funds scientific research to the tune of $4 million annually. And, and this is the most important one to me. It's mission-driven. National Geographic's mission, as it's stated on the website, is to inspire people to care about the planet. And then if you read a little bit more on the website, you'll find that the society encourages stewardship of the planet through research, exploration, and education. Uh, and with that, I do want to introduce Hans Wagner because Hans's position within the society is very much in keeping with the mission of the society. Hans is leading the society's initiative to become more sustainable in its operations with the goal of getting the society to walk the talk, and he has much to say about that. Under Hans' leadership, the society undertook a complete carbon footprint of the operations of its headquarters. Hans, in addition to being the CSO, is also responsible for the imaging lab, which is formerly the photo lab, um, and he's helping the society pioneer the digitiz digitization of the magazine content and on-demand printing. In a former job, he was responsible for the production, quality control, and distribution of the magazine. And even before that, he was responsible for the Society's paper purchasing and management. Uh, he ha so he has a wide background and understanding of issues uh, pertaining to paper. It was during these days in the 80s that he developed a keen interest in sustainable forest management, forest certification, and paper recycling issues. In his personal life, he's committed to volunteerism and public service. He lives with his wife, Janet, in the town of Garrett Park, Maryland, where he serves on the town council. He is also active in serving international refugees, the homeless, the American Red Cross, and other civic and environmental organizations. He and his wife have three children of their own, and they have also foster-parented three young men from Vietnam and South Sudan. So with that, I want to turn the program over to Hans, and I want to remind you that you may ask questions anytime. We want this to be interactive, and I'll be asking questions as well. So please feel free to do that. Hans? Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be with you, and uh, thank you for the introduction and the kind words, Kathy. And um, at wherever you are, welcome to uh, this, this exchange. I want to make sure that we do it as, uh, as, uh, as openly and as, and as freely as possible as, as far, and uh, as freely as the technology allows us to. Uh, ask questions along the way if you have them. Uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do <coughs> is uh, talk very quickly about this is how we started the sustainability initiative at the National Geographic um, going back to 2006. Um, the organization of the initiative that I've created, um, and then uh, talk a little about my focus uh, in this initiative on carbon footprint the organization, uh, so that we can really have a way of addressing the basic issue, which I see as carbon emissions and climate change. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments, and then uh, going forward, what we are hoping to do. With that. Um, for those of you who know the National Geographic, you're familiar with these magazines. This is our magazine cover. 
and we've been very heavily involved in doing reporting on climate change and environment for many years. Climate change, the significant sort of a seminal issue was in September of 2004, which is the one on the left, which talk about uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, we've done subsequently an issue related to that, which is evidenced by the big thaw of uh, various ice masses, whether it's in the Arctic or in Greenland and other places, and what the consequences of that will be. Um, and then finally, the most recent one, and we've done other issues, we've done on deforestation. And finally, then, in 2013, we did a story in September on the rising seas. And what's particularly interesting to me on this one is um, we are, this cover says, shows what would happen to global sea level when, in, when we uh, have uh, ice melting around the world, um, when all the ice is melted around the world, and projections are we'll have an 18-foot sea rise, uh, sea level rise, so something, something in the order of um, uh, five meters. Um, and that's where the water line will be as far as the Statue of Liberty is concerned. And one is something that's really interesting, if you have not seen this issue, it has a very compelling fold-out map in it which shows all the continents and shows what happens when you have an 18-foot rise in sea level and particularly what happens to the shorelines of the continents. And when you really look at that and look at where some of the major population areas are, and New York City is included in that, and Lagos, Nigeria is included in that, and, and um, London is included in that, um, just visualize what the, what the change will be when this happens. And this is not... Uh, this is not going to happen any time in the next uh, decade, but projections are that we may have as much as a six-foot sea level rise by the end of this century. So this is a concern. What really uh, got me started in this initiative was not being aware that we were covering this information and being concerned that while we were intellectually aware of what was happening around the world, we weren't really acting on it. And here's a sort of this quick diagram of, uh, that shows what each of us as individuals or each of us as our companies are concerned or even our countries are concerned. We, have, we need to connect the dots of what each of us are doing. And in the, in the daily lives of most of us, whether it's that we leave lights on or we leave our computers sitting uh, not, uh, not powered up, that we have televisions left on or that we take long showers, or that we leave our, uh, that we overcool or overheat our houses. All of these things uh, have to do with adding carbon emissions to uh, the, um, and, and end up in contributing a carbon burden to the atmosphere, which of course is what leads to climate change. So I really think that we all have to participate in part of the solution. And so one of the things that really got me, my nature is that I, when I see and understand something intellectually, I'm inclined to want to act to make sure that I make a difference. And this is no different, about, different from uh, what, what I wanted to do at Geographic. I saw that we were publishing this information. I saw that we were intellectualizing and disseminating this information, but we really weren't doing anything much more differently from anybody else. And I really felt the need to have us be engaged in, in what we do intellectually. So I felt it was important to get involved. So in 2006, I started organizing a committee of about 15 people at Geographic who had like feelings. And what I did is, what we did is, we came up with a mission statement. That on the, th the first thing I wanted to do is make sure our CEO um, uh, was not only on board with what we we're doing, but would would allow us to pursue this. And so one of the vision statements we came up with is what you see here: is that the National Geographic Society should be a leader in environmental uh, responsible and sustainable practices, doing all it can reasonably do to walk the talk, and thereby have credibility in communicating the message to others. And what's important to me about this statement, uh, which he hardly endorsed, and we were organized starting in 2007, is the word credibility. To me, what we publish as, and what we say as an organization um, is about credibility. We have worked for many years to be a credible source. We double check our sources. We want to make sure that the information we convey is accurate and, and unbiased. And what, what, what is more important in being credible than acting on what you know? So I really felt that we needed to walk the talk and, and act on what we know. In other words, put into practice what we'd uh, put in the magazines. Hans, were you the first one to want to get this started? Were you the first one to take some initiative for the society?
who knows? I'm the first. I'm the person who who, uh, who said, you know, I went to the editorial staff first of all and said, okay, what are we going to do here? We, you know, how many, how many? We really, as an editorial staff, need to make sure that if we write these stories and if we believe them, then we ought to really be, uh, be addressing them on the way we behave and the way we operate our business. And I, the editor invited me to ask his staff um, to address them, and I said, what I would like to do is to have the editorial staff write a white paper to, uh, for the organization to say, you know, we need to act on what we know. He asked me to talk to his staff, and so I went to the monthly meeting, and I said, okay, how many of you believe in what we're reporting? And of course, everybody's hand shut up, whether they're researchers, whether they're photographers, whether they're editors, whether they're writers, whoever. They're all agreed. So I said, well, how many of you have seen uh, Inconvenient Truth, which is the Al Gore document on climate change? And most of them answered. And I said, okay, how many, as a consequence of those two pieces of information, have changed anything you do in your daily life? And two hands shot up. And they basically said, you know, we've, the, we've met the enemy, and it is us. You know, we have, we have to be part of the solution before, we, and if you're going to, again, if we're going to be credible and be seen as a credible uh, reporter of these, these pieces of, and these kinds of documents, we really have to be uh, walking the talk. We have to be seen as acting on what we know. So that's kind of the background. And out of that came uh, this, this committee that we started. And so when, uh, when we first met as a committee, we sort of I asked them, what are we going to do? We've got this huge problem ahead of us. You know, we've got so many opportunities as an organization to be engaged and to do something differently. Where do we start? And the consensus very right off the bat, um, that I um, sort of articulated was we have to that climate change is the single biggest threat we face. Every other environmental issue is a subset to climate change. When when we have happened, whether it's a sea level change or it's a temperature rise, and and creatures around the world, whether they be from flora or fauna, are going to be affected or will die off as a consequence. Climate change is the number one issue, and so we really started to focus on uh, developing a carbon footprint. And of course, developing a carbon footprint is to help, to help you understand where you are as an organization, so that you can look at it and say, what can we do to make this to make a change in what we do? And so Let me we ask said, you let's look. Question, Hans, if that's okay. When you and I were talking, maybe yesterday or a couple of days ago, you talked about certified forests, and you talked about the fact that certified forests aren't even safe as a result of climate change, uh, which I found to be very interesting. I had not really thought that through. Would you mind just telling the, the group yeah. what you told yeah. me about that? Very, very briefly, you know, we have a lot of forestry uh, 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 conservation protocols, whether it's the Forest Stewardship Council, whether it's Sustainable Forestry Initiative, whether it's the Canadian Standards Association, whether it's PEFC. Um, all of them have have protocols for how to manage forests so that they will do well and generate uh, new trees. The reality is that with climate change, um, and the classic example of this is what's happening in British Columbia, uh, which is pr largely a coniferous forest, uh, literally hundreds of acres, millions of acres of pine forests are dying because the pine borer from which it's been protected in the past because in the winter it got cold enough to kill them, um, are now subject to being killed by pine borers. So the poster child for why climate change is the trump card for all, uh, all of the uh, uh, environmental issues and concerns, of which there are many, is, is the, the, the boreal forest and, and the pine forests uh, that are dying off because of climate change which is allowing the pine borer to migrate further and further north uh, without being de uh, killed off in the winter times. So anyway, anyway, back to the slide here, we really felt we need to look at everything we do to measure the carbon footprint and then act on what we learn. And so that's kind of the initiative, that's, that's the, the point of this slide, is measure what you know, measure, know, act on what you know. And one of the things we said very early on is we, in this process, we wanted to be as transparent as possible. We wanted to be as credible as possible in a, for the same reason I just articulated a while ago. We wanted to, and part of that is to um, do third party verification. So if we came up with an analysis that said, we you know our carbon footprint is X, we wanted to have somebody to look at it and to make sure that our calculations were accurate, that our assumptions were right. And mind you, in 2006, 
many of the uh, tools we have now, such as the WRI supply chain uh, uh, tool, um, didn't yet exist. So we were sort of uh, learning as we went. And then finally, given that we wanted to be a change leader, both in the printing and publishing industries, but also as an industry. And from that, from there on, we, uh, as a committee, decided, you know, this is a lot of work. And let me step back and then say, uh, when I talk about a committee, these are all volunteers doing something on top of their normal jobs, and me included. None of this was, all of the things I'm going to talk about are done by a group of volunteers who are passionate about climate change and being more sustainable. You weren't the CSO at that point, correct? No, I was just, you know, my job was to um, get the magazine uh, uh, printed and out the door. Okay. Um, and so we said, what we said, we have this, this is a much bigger problem than the 15 of us can do. So let's do this. Let's get as many people in the National Geographic's uh, employee base involved by setting up subject-specific category um, committees, and you can see them listed there, the seven committees we established. And we th what the, the conclusion was, if we have subject-specific uh, committees, subcommittees, each chaired by a member of the steering committee, um, and populate those subcommittees with people from across the society, we would have a large group of people involved, we could enumerate and act on many more of the issues than we, than we um, could do as a group of 15, and we could be much more efficient. So part of the goal was here to be, get as much done as possible. Part of the goal was to get as many people involved as possible, so as to make it a really uh, democratic and popular uh, initiative. So what did you do to inspire people to join? Just join the effort, on. I sent an email and said, you know, we said, saying, we're going to start a, a climate change initiative, or I'm sorry, a sustainability initiative. Here's the committees, and here's the scope of what these committees will do. Would you like to participate? And we got over 100 people volunteering. So each of these committees was populated by about six or seven staff members. Um, and that's how we uh, started this initiative in, in 2007 when we were well, it took organized. an email to get people to sign up. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, we used email, and we have posters on uh, in the elevator uh, uh, corridors and that sort of thing. But mostly it's email, and uh, we did this over the course of four or five uh, weeks. And we've had uh, 150 people engaged, and people circle th cycle through these. But uh, basically, uh, and basically the, the way I've run these committees is I say to them, um, you guys come up with uh, uh, with all the goals that you want to attain this coming year. You tell me what quarter you're going to try to aim for. I then take all those, those goals and I aggregate them by quarter, and then I run the steering committee, which I chair, um, based on those first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter goals. I, t I tell the subcommittees and I tell the, ch the committee, look, we don't have to get all the goals done. If you get hung up on one, move on to one where, which we can get done. Uh, there's, there's no, you know, just this is not about c crossing everything off. This is about getting things done. And so what, what I've also done, because we are volunteers, I've focused on the fact that as we run the subcommittees or even the, or the, the steering committee, that I say we will meet once a month for an hour, and that's it. I always have an agenda. I always keep uh, the meeting to an hour so that people can, in fact, on their schedules, commit to an, a meeting or some kind of other um, uh, activity for the hour that we are closing. So I really try to respect that time, and I, I move the, the meetings along according to, this, uh, to the agenda so that we don't get bogged down and we stay focused. <clears throat> um, measuring carbon. I, I hope that you can see this clearly enough. This, this, in starting in 2007, we started to um, develop um, a carbon footprint for every activity that we, uh, we operate as a company. And you can see the big one in the yellow wedge is the National Geographic magazine, which constituted fully 37% of our carbon emissions. And by the way, on the, this was the one that was done in, 2000, um, in 2011. And you can see that we have a, at the bottom right there, we have, it's 140,000 metric tons. Um, and you can see the, the, the percentage of the various, uh, that the various segments of activity uh, contribute to our carbon footprint. So that, for instance, other magazines, of which we have three other titles, represent 8%. The travel agency that we operate represents 7%. Digital media is very interesting here, which in 2000, 
nine represented 11 percent, as you see has jumped up to 13 percent in 2011. In 2012, that number jumped up to 23 percent. So the only area that was really uh, dramatically growing is our digital media component. And what's, what's really interesting and of a concern to me is that digital media is one, and by digital media I mean uh, magazine apps, I mean the content that we, on our website that we put out, um, and, and things of that nature, this digital product that you harvest off a website somewhere and download. Um, that's, grow, that's more than doubled in the last four years. So the concern I have is that we need to manage that in some way. And a large part of what this is, is um, the, 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 the way we use our cell phones, our iPads, our laptops to gather information, information that sits on a server, and by virtue of it sitting on a server live so that any of us can connect to it any time of the day, any time in the world, any place in the world, uh, means that this is that that the storage mechanism and the access tool for getting this stuff out there is generating carbon emissions 24/7. And that's so, an Tom, issue that. Tell me, you told me yesterday when we were talking about this about you kind of did a comparison between actually printing a magazine versus digital, and uh, is there a best way to do it? Would we be better off if we want to contribute but, something to actually buy the paper magazine or? Kathy, we don't have an answer. What, I, what we're talking about is the need to have a study. We, at this point, don't have the basic, scientifically based documentation that says a page view of, a pre, of let's say, the New York Times newspaper in on, ink on paper has so many tons of carbon, contributes so many tons of carbon a day or a year versus a page view done digitally for the same content in the New York Times done digitally. And we don't have documentation, nor do we have a way to, to know what the carbon emissions for each of the two is. So there's a desperate need for us to measure what the, what the, the environmental cost is, both in carbon emissions as well as in the toxicity involved in the various media options, whether it's print, whether it's digital, whether it's television, whether it's uh, radio, we need to understand where, what the impact is when we use these media and what the carbon emissions associated with us are. And one of my, one of my big concerns is we've got all the, the generations coming along who are active on Facebook and Twitter and all of these information that's being stored somewhere blissfully while the, while, while the, while the users are blissfully thinking I'm being carbon neutral. Isn't it, it couldn't be further from the truth. The stuff is stored somewhere, and it's usually dependent on fossil fuels to maintain it. So that's so we, a, if the audience has any questions about this uh, at this point, let's just open it up. Uh, please feel free. What are your questions? I'm asking all of them. I'm sure some of you have some. Questions for Hans? This is Karen. It's not so much a question, but I'm just really surprised to hear this. I had no idea. So this is really good Good to know. Neither did I. I was shocked, and I thought I knew what was going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so this, <laughs> yeah, so this makes me wonder, um, so if I have things that are stored out there that are, I mean, is there anything I can do to decrease this, um, you know, and decrease my footprint on these digital items? Uh, you know, I, you know, the obvious answer is don't put as much. Be aware. The awareness is the biggest single thing. And you start thinking in terms of everything. Everything I do in the in in, a, in our technological society has a carbon footprint. And the question becomes one of uh, how how much information do we put on on these services? And is there any way that I once I put it there, I can then delete it? The only way you can unburden the system is to, on a regular basis, delete content that's being stored there. Um, and that's the biggest challenge. Is that, and one of the things I'm gonna, uh, I've been driving here at the National Geographic, and it and, uh, needs to happen, is that we need to have a very strict policy of the digital content that we put online, that we vet it at least once a year, and make sure that only those data that are critical and uh, current are kept. And if and everything else should be put on a on a st storage device that isn't act, that isn't live, you know. Put it on a on a hard drive somewhere. Put it on a, a CD or something. 
It shouldn't be sitting on a server. That's just the worst place to store anything when it comes to uh, climate change. That's really interesting because I get really lazy about that. Mm -hmm. So as a result of my... We, we're all guilty of it. It's just, yeah. it, it, it. That's just the reality. But we need to have this study and we need to have a discussion on it so that we can all be aware that, yes, we're concerned about what's happening, but at the same time, we're fueling what's happening by our lifestyles, by our activities, and the way we conduct our lives. Um, Hans, this is Bruce, Bruce Bramer. Just a question on the um, diagram that you had there. When it the, shows electricity and steam, the right. electricity and steam on the diagram that shows it in, up in your footprint, is that related just to the building use? No, or? That's, that's a very, the building is, is mostly electricity and uh, natural, uh, natural gas. We, um, uh, the, the, the steam piece is we rent a space in New York City and in uh, Chicago for advertising offices and television offices, and they allocate, they, they it's use steam to heat the buildings, and they allocate um, on a basis of square footage what we um, are responsible for. Okay, so when you were talking about the servers and electricity that's listed there, is that also yeah, part of that? We do have some servers at the National Geographic in our headquarters, but most of the servers that we use are off-campus, and it's a third-party supplied uh, service because we, okay. don't have, we don't have the reach to go around the, across the U.S. We don't have enough data centers, so we, 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 lease, we, we, we buy that service. And then if you do it across the world, they then sublet to second and third uh, uh, suppliers. Um, what we've done in the, in, at the National Geographic here is for the electrical consumption in our building, uh, we, have, we now buy Windrex and have since 2009, and we have been carbon offsetting on our uh, natural gas use so that we are essentially carbon neutral in the operation of our complex here. Does everybody know what an offset is? You, maybe somebody, maybe Bruce, can you tell the rest of us what an offset is in case some people don't know? I guess I look at that as um, offsets is like if you're buying wind or something, you know, that's a renewable energy. So you're using that instead of the typical fossil fuels by utility companies. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's, a log, that's a good example of it. An offset is basically um, buying um, clean uh, renewable energy uh, operations or investing in them um, to, to offset effectively the energy you use in your in your building and you can do the same thing for for um, you, you can plant you can put off you can buy offsets in tree plantations which help because when you plant the forest uh, they sequester carbon so more the more forest we grow the more carbon is absorbed uh, by the far by those trees out of the out of the atmosphere and so buying uh, a reforestation project against the the energy you consume is another way of offsetting what you do. Don't you at National Geographic have a forest? Don't you invest in a forest somewhere? Yeah, let me get to that later. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, back to that pinwheel or that pie chart. Um, it measures all of our emissions. The carbon emissions, I, I hope, I imagine most of you know, is largely divided into three categories. Scope one is uh, is what you use on site. For instance, if you if you're using a stove or you're heating your building, you use natural gas or, or fuel oil. That's um, scope one. Scope two is the importation of of energy and classic the classic example of this is electricity, which is generated and the carbon emissions uh, happen elsewhere but you have control of how much you use by the virtue of a switch that you flip. And the scope three is those carbon emissions that are generated by your suppliers. And in, my, in our case, um, that is paper manufacturers and printers largely, um, and then to distribution uh, services such as trucks and, and, and air and uh, surface, vessel, surface vessels on the oceans uh, to make the distribution. 96%, in our case, as a publisher, 96% of our emissions are scope three. So we, the scope one and scope two for us is around 4%. And that's interesting because you don't have direct control over yeah. that. Well, the philosophy with which we operate here is that we, re we have to reduce what we can. In other words, be smart about the energy we consume and, and mitigate it by do using less, and then offset what we cannot. So obviously, there's a limit to how much natural gas you cannot use. 
and the limit to how much electricity you can not use. And then you, we offset that by buying uh, in various projects. And the, we set a goal last year for the company of having zero carbon emissions, um, and the target date we are looking at is 2018, possibly 2019, so that we would offset not only what we consume here, but what is consumed on the part of our suppliers. So this is carbon neutral for scope one through scope three. And then we have another uh, goal of zero waste to landfill, which we hope to achieve by 2018. We are currently at 63% uh, um, of landfill avoidance. Okay, some quick accomplishments here. This is, by the way, on the right-hand side is our building complex. Uh, the, this bu the building with the vertical uprights uh, is a 1984, 1964 vintage. The building to the left, which is with cantilevered sort of uh, uh, terraces, is a 1984 vintage. Um, and this is our compound. So these are some of the things we've accomplished. And again, this is a volunteer group having done these things. We, are, we joined US EPA's Climate Leaders Program, which is a protocol for measuring your carbon footprint and standardizing the process for doing it. Um, we have joined uh, the US EPA's Climate Star Certification Program, which, uh, I'm sorry, Energy Star Certification Program, and we have been an Energy Star Certified Complex for five consecutive years. Um, we installed video conferencing centers in 2007, and that was to try to, to eliminate the need for some travel. Um, we became, um, we did a complete energy audit. Uh, we wanted to find out from a third party what is that we could do beyond what we'd already done to make the, to make the building more energy efficient, and we acted on those findings. Um, again, uh, we, the video conferencing reduced our travel uh, by about 20% in 2000, in the following year, which is 2008. One of the things we did when we did the energy audit, we said, you know, this building was built uh, 40 years ago, at the time, well, almost 50 years ago, and the, fa the fact is that we're still using uh, uh, this array of uh, maybe as many as 10 uh, fluorescent tubes in an office to light it up. And so we start debulbing it. We basically start taking bulbs out of the system one at a time and say, when, at what point does the occupant of that building, of that office, notice it? And so we basically took about 60% of the bulbs out before anybody noticed it. And obviously, a bulb taken out reduces your usage. Um, we again, we went to wind powered recs, um, or renew, which on rec is a renew, renewable energy certificate. So, um, it, it, which is a way of certifying that uh, the credits that you buy are legitimate, they've been audited, and they're accounted for. So you can't trade more than what's available in the system. And we carbon footprint travel. We're going on very quickly with an, uh, as we go uh, chronologically, uh, one of the things we did as, as a consequence of having um, uh, we're finding that, that we couldn't get our energy usage down very significantly. We audited the number of computers that were being left on. We came up with a number of 40 percent. So we worked with our IT division to have them, to have them uh, basically hibernate them at 11 o'clock at night so they would shut down. We subsequently, in subsequent years, moved that hibernation date uh, time up to 9 o'clock, and it's currently at, at 7 o'clock. Uh, we became carbon neutral as a complex um, here in Washington, D.C. in 2009. Uh, we did a complete life cycle assessment study on the magazine in 2009 when we did that with our printer and our paper manufacturer. So the, the life cycle assessment was specific to the kind of paper we used, specific to the mill where it was made, specific to the energy pattern, and the same with the printer. They, who had previously carbon footprint in the operation, so they knew when we uh, came up with the carbon footprint. So we know what the carbon emission per copy of the magazine is, and on an annual basis, it's, it's, uh, the magazine is equivalent to about a gallon of gasoline. So if you can drive, if you can either buy 12 issues of the National Geographic or you can drive 20 miles, effectively that gives you a comparison. We've been a LEED certified building complex since 2003. We achieved, this is for an existing building, set of buildings. We've achieved uh, gold standard in 2009. We were recertified gold in 2012. We are recertifying this year for 2014. We have been the most 
frequent, the most often recertified complex in LEEDS history. We issued in 2010, we issued a commuter subsidy to encourage more people to get out of their cars, so we now subsidize their mass transit use. Um, and we start composting all organic waste, and that it means not only the food waste in the cafeteria, all paper products that can't be recycled, including paper towels that are used in the bathrooms. So everything is composted. Um, so quickly, in 2011, we also became aware we were, had started to require our paper suppliers to use only certified wood in our, in our paper. And the reason for doing so was that um, certification of forest is the only way I, as a paper buyer, can know that the, the fiber coming, that it's going into my paper is not illegal or uh, that it's not contributing to deforestation worldwide. So we, commit, we committed funds to help certify 800,000 privately owned acres in Maine. Um, we then committed the National Geographic Society to use 100% certified fiber on the magazine starting in 2011. Subsequently, all of our magazines are now, and all our catalogs are now on 100% certified fiber, which means it's tracked from the owner of the land, and whatever wood is harvested on that land is required to be replanted into new forest. We adopted a triple bottom line as a way of accounting uh, what we do in 2012. Um, we made sustainability part of our mission 2015. 2015 is a mission, um, it was an, a review by the National Geographic to identify where it's going to be in 2015. And one of the things that I pushed for is to make sure that sustainability would be part of that, uh, of that process. Um, we opened a farmer's market in our courtyard in 2012. He showed, he's here every Tuesday doing basically from April through November and that's open to anybody in the Washington downtown area. Um, and we joined Forest Partners in 2012. Um, Forest Partners is an initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative to certify 10 million acres by the end of 2017. We made a commitment to contribute $20,000 a year for five years to that effort. And you did all of this with volunteers? Yes. Very quickly, Here's our usage history of water, and you can see that we reduced our water usage from uh, 2002 uh, to, through 2012 by 36%, and uh, more than half of that is in the last four years. And I could tell you what we did to try to get there, uh, but I'm not sure that we, I think we may be running short of time. Same thing with electrical use. Uh, we reduced uh, our electrical usage from 2002 by 17%, even though we've become much more computerized, have many more servers, um, uh, and uh, we've and that reduction has almost 10% of that has been in the last four years. <clears throat> and with the with the natural gas use down 23% um, in the in the 10 years and 16% since 2008. Here's an interesting slide that talks about waste uh, that we sent to landfill. And as recently as 10 years ago, all this waste was going to landfill. The green is what's being composted, and you can see, and this is a slightly counterintuitive uh, slide because the furthest history is on the right-hand side, the most recent is on the left-hand side. So you can see the green component, which is the, co the composting piece, has almost doubled. The uh, blue, which is the recycling effort, has has declined, but most of that is because we're diverting it to compost. Importantly, the red portion, which is what we sent to landfill, has declined from uh, uh, 415,000 uh, uh, tons to 358,000 tons, and so we're heading in the right direction. So, so the goal that we have um, is that we take the, right, the red portion and, and make that zero, either by recycling more or composting more. Here's a very quick uh, snapshot of costs. In the aggregate, we've, we're saving this company about $550,000. Um, um, and you can see some of the contributors to that, uh, avoided landfilling fees, Green Fridays, which is what we, we, we now issue employees uh, six, eight to nine days of Fridays without work 
in order to keep the building closed, and that helps save us about $20,000 a year and keeps our energy consumption down. And then computer hibernation, hibernation saved us about $100,000 a year, which ironically is what, it, what, it, what the premium was for uh, switching to wind racks. So by doing the right thing, we could do an even better thing. Um, we set goals for the 2015 mission of a further 5% reduction in electrical use, and that, re that is 100% driven by, by behavior changes, a 10% uh, savings in water, and a 25% landfill reduction. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's going to be hard to manage, but we, we think we can do it. And then f the 5% at the bottom is reducing the scope 3 emissions. That's basically reducing the emissions on the part of our suppliers by 5% by 2015. So we don't have control of how they run their business, but by working with them, we may be able to identify ways that they can help us. And we've, already, we've exceeded that goal by about 10% already. As I said, in, in uh, 2012, we made the case that we should be a triple bottom line driven company. And in our case, rather than saying profit, uh, we started using the word proceeds because we are a non-for-profit and some, especially our accounting office is a little bit nervous about using the word uh, profit. So we, this is a, a culture change for us where we have to figure out a way that we can do the planet and the people piece and more importantly how to weigh the planet and people piece against the manufacturing and cost piece. And how do you measure um, the value that a supplier brings in the people and planet components as opposed to pricing, and we are working on the on the methodology for making the, for doing the calculations that help us do that. We set goals, as I said, in every year. The the principal goals we had for 2013 were to adopt a sustainability policy, which we did. We wrote a very extensive, very aggressive sustainability policy. Now we have to enforce it with our suppliers. Uh, we, as I said, we implemented the triple bottom line, and the, the what we spent 2013 doing was we also we developed the the, um, the, the metrics for how we want to capture uh, environmental and social issues, and we're in the process of uh, capturing that information. Um, the Mission 2015 goals we talked about, which is a reduction in electrical water and uh, landfill. Um, we work with our. We wanted to work with our suppliers on greenhouse gas reductions, and we have, in fact, uh, worked with our printer and basically made the printing of all our magazines and all our cat catalogs carbon neutral by buying Windrex and by buying um, methane capture at, in a landfill to offset the natural gas used and the electricity consumed in producing our magazines on, a, on an annualized basis. Um, and again, a 5% reduction in electric use is a goal by 2015. Okay. Um, that said, um, just a quick summary of um, well, my experiences. Again, I have no qualifications in this, uh, being a CS, a CS uh, Chief Sustainability Officer. I basically am led by my I know what is what we have to do. I know that we have to live by, our, by what we know and we have to make happen based on what we understand to be the reality. So buy-in from the top is critical for me, was critical for me. Um, setting goals is absolutely essential, and I believe in stretch goals. We, on an annual basis, set about a goal list of about 60 to 70 goals from these various committees. We achieve about 40 to 45 of those. Um, Clearly, behavior change is an important part in the organization because you do have to get people to help with something as simple as segregating their waste in the cafeteria into the bucket that says this is, this is trash, this is compost, and this is uh, recyclable. And that's, it's, um, it's, behavior change is hard, um, and it requires constant communications. Uh, sustainability saves the real dollars. I mean, in everything we've done, you can almost, in every case, put a dollar value on it, and that speaks loudly to the people at the top. Um, and uh, then finally, I think no matter at what level we do it, collectively, they all make a difference because climate change is only going to be addressed if we all pitch in at some level. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of what we've done. Again, let me remind you that um, this is a volunteer-driven effort. 
Um, I became CFO as a consequence of the initiative um, so that in 2010 they recognized, it was recognized what we had accomplished and since I was leading in the initiative uh, I became the CSO um, and um, that's a very broad, very quick snapshot of what we've done here at the National Geographic. I have some questions folks. What are your questions? Yeah, Steve, Steve has a question. Well, what you've done is amazing. I think anybody listening is impressed. How do you share what you've done to help change others or help others in their own process of, uh, of uh, moving toward a triple bottom line uh, be more efficient thanks to the uh, ground you've already plowed? Um, we don't do it well. And I'm embarrassed to say that because we are a communications company. But we also are a communications company that is uh, very aware of its role and its, and its image as being a sustain, uh, being a, basically a conservation um, promoting organization. We do footage on what's happening in the world. We do magazine stories on what's happening in the world. And to some, to some, to a large extent, I see that as a burden because we are afraid, in, in some instances, I believe, to really open up with what we've done, and let either use the media, or to to let people know what we've done. And my view is that as a sustainability head, with the stated goal of wanting to be a leader, you can't lead if you don't talk about what you've done. And I think, and I think the concern is that we might be perceived as sounding self-serving self -serving in telling this message. I believe you can do this in a very non-self-serving way, highlighting the fact that this is a responsibility that we have, that we woke up to it late, but we, that after we did wake up to it, we in fact are taking the bull by the horns and we're charging ahead. And we want to, uh, and uh, we think that this is an opportunity that every enterprise in this country, in the world, um, has an opportunity to follow. So I don't think we do a, I mean, your question is the right one. I don't, I personally would like us to be much more aggressive in telling this story. And for instance, on the, the perfect example uh, for where we could do this really well, on the story we did uh, when I talked about the September issue and the, what happens when sea level rise reaches uh, 18 feet, what we could have easily done is spend, uh, spend a page at the end of that story that says, in doing the research and in, in doing and coming up with the findings of this story, we've become increasingly aware that we are complicit is, and we're part of uh, the, the problem. And here are the things, as a consequence, we're doing to try to make a difference. And then just list them without any other, and just saying, if you have any other, you as members or readers have any other suggestions, please submit them. And that way you can engage them you can uh, make sure that they understand. And I think in most cases, when you're asking people for their suggestion, they will probably say, well, you know, if I make a suggestion, I probably should follow up on this and do it myself. <laughs> True. Other questions? So are you still the only person who's in a paid position? The rest of the people are, are all still volunteers? Actually, as of last October, um, I got some help. And so now I have somebody who's the only full-time person uh, who's paid to do this job because I'm still, as uh, Kathy said, I still have uh, production responsibility. Um, okay. and, but, but you know, the reality is we've gotten to the point now we've done a lot. I'm proud of what we've accomplished. But uh, in order to, to make this sort of, to get to the next threshold, we really have to have the CEO uh, making this part of uh, the job that everybody here has. And the, the word has to come from the CEO. And where is the CEO on that, huh? Oh, he's brand new, so I think he's 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 going to be really good in this. Uh, but he's in over his head at this at this point still, trying to figure out uh, what he signed up for. Okay. I, you know, he's, he's, I think he's found that the National Geographic has got their hands in a lot of things, and there's a lot to be learned. And uh, but I think he's saying the right things. And I'm very hopeful that uh, with his uh, leadership, we can take this to the next level. Other questions? Just jump in. Yeah, Hans, this is Bruce Bramer. Just a question you mentioned about the suppliers and the efficient, or the um, uh, reductions that they're doing. Do you see them doing more offsets, or do you see them looking at energy efficiency and how to improve and reduce the energy of the per se, the equipment and things that they already have, and looking at it from an efficiency improvement standpoint. The two main suppliers from a dollar volume standpoint are our printer, 
and our paper manufacturers and uh, manufacturer, and they're both very aggressive and have for many years, especially as a printer, has been very aggressive about looking at efficiencies because they know they're smart business people, and they know that um, that the biggest cost of their operation is energy. So they know that by, by being smart in you, the kinds of motors you install and um, by the kinds of lighting you install, and when you build a plant, you build skylights into the roof rather than having everything be lit, or they have big windows on their plants so that they harvest as much natural light as they can in order to take advantage of what's there for nothing as opposed to... So I think they're all very much engaged. And um, our printer, our, our paper manufacturer has been very aggressive about going to biomass as a fuel source, um, so it gets steering away from uh, fossil fuels as the primary source for operating of their operations of their mill to going increasingly to biomass, and I think they're now at 75 or 80 percent as a company of their energy is now biomass, uh, which is residuals from the forest product side. So I think the for most now a lot of the smaller suppliers I think it's you know as I said as a triple bottom line and the sustainability policy we have we in the next year and a half or two years will have to go through a process of saying and we've sent out a document to the sustainability policy and said to them this is what we believe needs to happen and this is how we want to conduct our business at the National Geographic and we would like you as a supplier to be in footstep with that that doesn't mean you have to be there today. But we'd like to hear from you, and what are you doing in these areas? And we sent a questionnaire out w uh, with that. And then work with them if they're not compliant to figure out how they can become compliant. And they can choose to, to come along with us, and if they choose not to, uh, they know they can't be a supplier to us going forward. Okay. No, very good strategy. Thank you. Other questions? We're running a little bit over, but if you have questions, ask them. We do actually have a couple questions that have come through the chat. We can't see the chat. We can't see them. Hi, it's Paul Brooks. I asked a question over the chat about uh, publicizing uh, your work, Hans, through uh, GRI or perhaps the Cargo Disclosure Project. Uh, do you do that or have you thought about doing that? I've thought about doing that, and again, um, we have a communications division, and they tend to be they tend to shy away from that. Um, I think this is a this is a case where we have to learn how to do this um, because it's important. It's not what we've done. It's not what we. It's not about any of us. Any uh, any of us. It's about the example that this company has 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 put out there, can put out there, and saying there is a way of running a business differently, of being successful while at the same time being climate responsible. And, I, 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 you know, we have to figure out a way to send that message out. And I think it has to be a larger audience than, than G, uh, GRI or, the, or, or any of the other. This, we have to go mainstream media on this. Yeah, and, we, again, I think we, we should do it with, uh, using our own uh, product. Jessica, we can't see the questions. Could you please uh, let Hans know what they are? Yeah, and don't worry about mine that I put on there, Jessica. I'll just research that on the Internet. This is Karen. Okay. I, I, no problem, Karen. I think that, that uh, Paul just asked his, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Was that... Any yeah. other questions from the group? What was Karen, what was your question having to do with the uh, web search? Oh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I know some basic things about sustainability, but just was looking for more ways that I can, um, for my home and my home office, decrease my footprint. But I'm sure I could find it on the Internet. It was just kind of a simple question, if there was a favorite resource mm -hmm. well, there, or there, website that you like. There, there's so many ways we can do it. I mean, just start looking around your house and say, what am I doing, and do I need to do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you like to buy that? <laughs> that's, another, that's another way. <sighs> I mean, I, you know, it's, a, it's something as simple as uh, saying, I'm going to make my showers two minutes shorter. Or, you know, going and buying a, an LED light bulb every six months as opposed to buying another one. Or, uh, you know, looking at the temperature you keep your house at, whether it's cool or heat, and saying, do I need to be, can I be two degrees lower or two degrees higher, depending on the season? I mean, all of that makes a difference. And um, so, and you can, everybody can buy offsets of their home operations. There are lots of offset calculators out there um, uh, that you can use to calculate what your carbon emissions are 
based on the size of your home and your practices, based on the size of your car and your mileage, based on uh, the amount of travel you do, and you can buy offsets in a whole range of products uh, or projects that are really compelling and, and make a difference. Um, so every homeowner can do that. Every homeowner can buy wind racks. Uh, you know, they're, they're available through your utility or through uh, in every market there's somebody selling um, uh, renewable energy, which may be a little bit more expensive on the homeowner side, but, it, it, but um, it's, in the right, it's doing the right thing. Okay, any other questions? Well, let me close by saying when I first talked to Hans, uh, I was saying, because of our research, that the CEO is the one who needs to start these things. And Hans corrected me immediately and said, you can get a lot done with volunteers. And then he went about showing me what they've done with volunteers. Hans, on a closing note, is there anything that you would advise others to either do or not do in, tr in terms of getting volunteers in a position where they can get the buy-in of the senior managers? I'm not sure I understand your question. Oh, are there things that they should avoid? If, if people are putting volunteer efforts together and they're trying to uh, advocate to the, the CEO, for example, or other senior managers to adopt the mission, for example, is there a right way to do that or a wrong way to do that? My philosophy is that um, you know you 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 do what you think needs to be done, and you communicate that up and say, "Here's what we're doing," and you show the benefit of it. Whether it's employee health, whether it's employee, uh, you know, the re the reality is that in today's market, every study that's been done has said the young people coming out of uh, universities and colleges want to work for a company that is socially responsible and that cares about, makes a difference about the environment. We're going to attract better people and we're going to attract the right people if we're the kind of employer who uses um, principled approach to doing business, a particular principled approach to, to being sustainable. Um, people will give up salary in order to work for company, companies they believe in and I think that's a message. And then, of course, you can also quantify the savings. You know, we can, if you work with your building engineer and, and say, let's switch out these bulbs, or let's switch to a different, slightly different temperature, and then document what, what the dollars are at the bottom line are um, for really no inconvenience and for, most, for things that most people don't even notice, um, that they're real bottom line savings. And if you can expand those or multiply on what you've done, then you can also get a multiplier to the savings. And okay. so I, um, you know, again, my, I'm, I'm one of these people who believes that you, you, you act on what you know um, and you convince those who aren't acting on what they know uh, to help you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, attending today. This is our first one. Uh, if you have suggestions for us for the next one, let us know. The next one is going to be on July 10th. Uh, it will be with Elizabeth Heider, who is the CSO of the Skanska Corporation, which is a global project management and construction company. Um, very, very big company. And she will be talking, she's new in her position, and she'll be talking with you about how to get the companies that they've acquired th uh, in order to grow, how to bring them on, on board with sustainability. So thanks again, and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, Hans, so much. Have a good our day, everybody. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.